Moving on to our keynote speaker, who we'll be looking for, and they've been looking forward to his wisdom of intention and uh, intention for a better world, a better you. And I'm sure we'll touch on brief parts of that and a little more in depth as well. Tony is one of the most prolific visionaries of our time. He's an inspired storyteller, the author of 11 self empowered books, and is the co founder of the Intenders of the Highest Good, a grassroots community movement with Intender circles in countries all over the world. His widely acclaimed Vision Alignment Project recently surpassed 2 million alignments. He has produced three full-length videos, over 130 YouTube videos for the Intenders channel, and has appeared on numerous TV and radio shows, including Coast to Coast AM, which you can hear on Wood Radio here in Grand Rapids. His latest book, The Intenders Handbook, Two Roads Home, is a long-awaited sequel to his bestseller, The Intenders Handbook. Please welcome our keynote, Tony, as he presents Taking Intention, to the next level. Tony Burroughs. Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> okay. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. <laughs> it is an honor to be here with you this day. And I'd like to, whoops. Sorry. How are we doing? Testing, testing? You just keep going. Okay. <laughs> Start off with some gratitude. And uh, very grateful to um, Steve Krejcik, Ken Havens, John Davis. And all of you who have helped to put this wonderful event together because uh, it's truly, you don't get these kind every day. And it's a, a true blessing for me to be here with you. And uh, those of you who are familiar with my work know that I do not do much of anything without making an intention first. So if you'll bear with me for a minute, I'm going to do that right now. I intend that for each and every one of us here, that we are all held in the highest light imaginable. That everything needing to be known is known here this day. That all of my words and all of all of our words are clear, precise, uplifting, helpful, and fun. That we are all guided, guarded, protected, and connected throughout this entire experience. And that everything we say and do serves the highest, the highest and best good of the universe, ourselves, and everyone everywhere. And so be it, and so it is. Now, gosh, I wish I knew what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> but it, se it seems like uh, one of the subjects that's most interested to me nowadays is the uh, fact that we are creating the world that we are going to enter. And we're creating that world with our thoughts and our words and our actions. And so it just seems wise for us to put a little more attention on those thoughts and those words so that we get the results we're looking for. <clears throat> and that brings up the idea of what is creation and what is what I like to call miscreation because one of the things that I'm seeing as I travel the world is a whole lot of miscreation. Now, Creation itself is putting our, my attention on thoughts and words that serve me and my fellow travelers. Thoughts and words that will give me the results I'm looking for. Miscreation is a different ballgame. Miscreation is uh, perhaps best uh, exemplified by uh, the words two of the most important words in our vocabulary, those words are I am. 
And when you hear somebody putting um, the word broke after I am, or sick after I am, you know they're miscreating because they're not, those things are not going to give them the results they're looking for. And my teachers both told me that uh, there is no more powerful phrase in the vocabulary than I am. The second most powerful phrase after that is I intend. Anything you put after those words, it's barreling down on you like a freight train. Because indeed, the law of attraction does work. We call it the intention process, but it's the same thing. Our thoughts create our future. Our thoughts create our world. Our thoughts create our experiences. Any way you want to look at it, our thoughts are creating everything. So again, it's just wise for us to hold our attention on the thoughts that serve us. Ah, yeah. I have had a couple of teachers in my life, and I'd like to share some stories with you about them. Uh, before I do that, one of the uh, things that I wanted to give you an example of, one more about the miscreation, is uh, a story that happened to me, oh, about a year and a half ago. I'm, I'm uh, on a circular couch in, uh, with a group of friends, there's several of us sitting on this big couch and some chairs on the other side in a circle. And well, one of the ladies there in the, on the couch with us, her name was Millie. And Millie was, uh, she was starting to complain about getting older. Mm -hmm. And she started to talk about the problems she was having with her back and with her neck and with her other parts of her body and her lack of family, her lack of friends, her lack of finances. Then she went into the government and the health care system, <laughs> groaning on and on, way past the point of comfortable conversation. <laughs> and then, so and just as she's getting ready to reach her crescendo with all of this, she turns over and she looks at me and she says, Tony, she says, what do you think about getting older? <laughs> <laughs> and I realized that if I agreed with her, then I set myself up to go through the same experiences she's going through. Not only me, but everybody else sitting on the couch. I would reinforce a miscreation. Because the proper creation is, I am healthy. I am well. I am I am in perfect health. And it gets to be sort of a fun thing, actually, trying to figure out the positive way to say things. Because we all, nowadays, when we're in groups like this, we're always looking to figure out, to help each other say things positively. We're always reminding each other that, uh, that it's wiser to keep things in the positive. And, I don't know about, uh, about, about you again, but if I'm in a group uh, with people and I start to say something that I wouldn't want to manifest in a jillion years, and I would hope that there's other, I, actually I would intend that there's other people in that group who would nudge me and say, <coughs> hey Tony, you might not want to say that way, that that way, because it's just not going to give you the, the final outcome that you're looking for. In other words, we keep ourselves awake to what it is we're creating with our thoughts and words in communities like the Coptic community here. Keep ourselves awake. We help each other create as opposed to miscreate. You see. Now, I'm reminded of uh, in the early days of our contender circles, we used to have people come to us uh, with their dramas. In fact, uh, uh, we got to call them their hip pocket dramas. And you know what I'm talking about. It's like you're talking along to somebody and all of a sudden you realize you're getting embroiled in this drama. And it's just like they just whipped it out of their pocket on you. <laughs> and now you've got to deal with it. And I'm not talking about a bona fide challenge issue, but a recurring kind of a drama. 
And we wanted to help those folks, but we realized that if we agreed with them about their hip pocket dramas, then we were reinforcing the, the drama. And so we got together and we talked about it. Said, How can we help those folks? Uh, um, we, we don't want to go down in the swamplands of the drama with them too far. It's okay to go a little bit, but uh, you, wanna, you only want to go down far enough to get them and bring them back up to where you are, not go down and wallow in the swamp with them. So we talked about this, me and the lady I started the intenders with her name was Tina. And so we got a plan. And the plan was to, whenever we felt like somebody was getting ready to lay a hip pocket drama on us, and you, you, could, you could sort of feel it. It's a kind of a recurring thing. And uh, you know that uh, if, uh, if, uh, if that's starting to happen, then you want to be a little more aware of what's going on. So when they started into it, they just get into the drama a little bit, and they get going, and we would go, oh. Or we'd go, hmm. We wouldn't even nod our head. You nod your head, and that's an agreement. <laughs> There's an exchange of emotional charge. Emotionally, and you've got to, you go away having to figure out what I'm going to do. I've been done, done, dream, or whatever. And they just go on to the next person, the next person, the next person. Nothing really ever changed for them. And I, I didn't do them any good. You see this all the time. So, uh, we, we got pretty good at going. We get into it, we go, oh, or hmm. And, what we found out over time is that they, they, they come around the back door, they try, oh no, he's not buying that one. I'll, uh, uh, I'll try another one. And they come around the side door, and, uh, uh, but we would we just go with the O oh and the O oh again. <laughs> Never shaking our head. Uh -uh. And uh, what we found is that they would go home and they'd be thinking to themselves, Gosh, that guy didn't, uh, I wasn't able to dump on that guy. I wasn't able to lay my excess emotional baggage on him. And uh, maybe, uh, maybe something he's doing, or she's doing, is working for him. Maybe, maybe, I, I'll, uh, uh, maybe I'll just hold off on some of those drums. Maybe I'll just see what happens if I don't go on and keep doing that. And, uh, In other words, we were setting an example for them. And instead of feeding and reinforcing their drum, we were feeding and reinforcing them having to go think about looking at it another way. Hmm. So interesting nowadays. I love John's talk this morning about he, he, several times he used the word balanced. And and I think that's a lot of what we're going through nowadays. Right? How do we stay centered and balanced in the midst of chaos? Carol Ray was talking about it too. How do we stay centered and balanced no matter what is going on around us? I don't know about you, but that's high on my priority list. And there's no, no question that the universe gives me plenty of opportunities of uh, adversity and uh, challenges and so forth to practice that. That's one of the nice things about these times we're living is you think that, oh my goodness, you watch the news for any length of time and realize, uh, oh, how are oh, we ever going to make it? But how do, I, how do I stay happy in the midst of all of that? And indeed, it can be done. But first you have to realize that's what's going on. How do we stay centered and balanced no matter what? No matter what. So, I was very fortunate to have two teachers. And the first one, this was back in the 80s on the big island of Hawaii, and his name was BJ. And BJ was a tall, lanky fellow from Pennsylvania. And uh, he was, uh, uh, wore a old fatigue jacket and a ball cap. And, um, he had been an instructor 
for a group of people in the East San Francisco Bay Area back in the late 60s and 70s who called themselves the Morehouse. And the philosophy behind the Morehouse was that they showed you how to get more of whatever it is you wanted. Well, that rang my chimes. And so I, uh, I uh, invited BJ to come up and build a little coffee ch shack on the other side of my uh, land. And over the next 18 year period, he was passing along uh, the Morehouse information to me while we were fixing trucks. Uh, and building houses and planting gardens and terracing steep lands and all of that. And, uh, and it, seemed, uh, it seemed like whatever jam or issues or challenges I had at any given time, uh, that uh, putting the uh, information that he was giving me to use seemed to get me out of that issue, that jam. Uh, it was a, he was passing along his body of esoteric information. And, and uh, little did I realize that behind the scenes, it was BJ who was orchestrating it. So I got into the jam I was in and had to use the information he was passing along to me to get out of it. The masters are very interesting folks. He was, uh, he was the spitting image. If you've ever seen a picture of a fellow named Saint Germain, he was the spitting image of Saint Germain. Except they had a broken off tooth. <laughs> the masters will take on any guys so that they can get their message across to you. Any guys so you are comfortable with them and so it's easier for us to get their message across to you. And for the next 18 years, while we were fixing trucks and building houses and doing all the stuff you do to put together a self sustaining piece of property. Um, he was uh, passing his knowledge to me. And BJ was a master of communication. In fact, he'd been a teacher of communication at the Morehouse. And he, uh, he said that there's a big difference between communicating and talking. He says, Communicating is, I've got an idea in my head, and I'm going to do whatever is necessary to get it into your head. Until that happens, communication hasn't happened. Until that happened, it was just talk. You know, and a lot of talk going on, and that's nothing, nothing wrong with that. But communication actually takes a certain consciousness, a certain awareness a certain commitment on the part of the communicator. The, the person who's being communicated to really doesn't have that much to do with it quite frankly, except to give his permission. And I did. And so, um, BJ was, in some ways, was sort of a harsh teacher. I mean, he, he used the, the button pushing method. He pushed every button you could imagine. And, uh, we did that for a while, 18 years. And BJ, he, he told me a story one day, and I remember one day coming up to his coffee shack and he was sitting uh, looking over the, uh, we're in the Kona Coast, looking over the west coast of the Big Island, having, uh, having his usual eggs and toast for breakfast. And, uh, and I was telling him that I'm having some uh, money challenges and, and uh, did he have any advice for me on that? Because uh, I had this four and a half acre farm that I got back in the early 70s. And, and I didn't realize that farms take on money, keep going. And so uh, he said, Tony, he said, there's two ways, money-wise, to be happy. He said, the first way is to do whatever you have to do to go out and make a a jillion dollars, a million dollars, whatever. And uh, nowadays a million might not even do it. But, uh, and he said, if, if you do that, he said, it may take you a few years and quite a bit of work to do it, but after you do that, you can create an environment around yourself where you can find uh, freedom and happiness within that environment, 
without the outside world uh, encumbering. The second option, he said, was to be deliberately poor, to take life as it comes, and trust that the universe will provide whatever you need whenever you need it. And so I had a decision to make. Do I want to stop go away from the farm and go see what I can do to make a, a jillion dollars? Or do I want to just be deliberately poor? And obviously, I took the second route. <laughs> and, and it helped in my work, quite frankly, because in, in putting the law of attraction or the intention process to work, in order for my uh, writings and, and whatever I'm doing to be valid, um, I have to integrate the law of attraction into my life. I have to trust in it. And so I've never taken a job in my adult life. Just always trusted that whatever I need will be there for me in the minute I need it. So far, so good. <laughs> so. Uh, so I took the second route, and the neat thing about the second route was, the next morning I didn't have to go out and find a job and figure out where I'm going to move, go make a jillion dollars. The next morning I got up and had eggs and toast and went out and puttered around the farm and worked on the truck, and, and every day I could get up and do what I wanted to do that day. Just trusting that the universe is user friendly. And all I had to do to take advantage of that user-friendliness was to keep um, keep from going on some of my all-too-frequent scarcity rants. <laughs> and so uh, right away it worked. And wasn't long before we started the intenders after uh, BJ and I went our separate ways and um, and I had the chance to just keep putting that back to the test. So my life has been a, a testimonial to putting the law of attraction to work without having to go and do something for somebody else and do the, the, the paycheck right. He said, he said that uh, you can do the millionaire route or you can do the deliberately poor route and the trust route. And he says, anything in between that tends to lead to middle class servitude. And he said, he didn't think that's what I wanted for him. Hmm. I remember another time I was talking to him about money. It's an interesting subject. Most of us have got some uh, familiarity with it. And he said, uh, he said, tell me, he said, you know the difference between me and you? And I remember giving him a glib answer. I said, well, you're taller. <laughs> and, and he said, he said, he gave me what in Hawaii we called the stinker. I can't even do it. But he gave me a sort of a strange look. And he said, that's not what I'm talking about. I said, okay, well, BJ, I said, what is the difference between me and you? And he's talking about himself. He says, he says, I'm secure. And he didn't say the next three words, which would have been, and you're not. <laughs> he said, yeah, I said, I'm secure. He said, if I need anything to come to me, I just use the laws of manifestation. That's what we call it back then. To uh, manifest, I make an intention, and what I need comes to me. He said, "You, on the other hand, he said you measure your definition of your security by how much money you've got in the bank account or in your wallet. And oh, by the way, if your wallet gets a little bit thin or your bank account uh, gets a little low, he said you start to panic." He said, he just thought it was a much better idea for me to, to uh, begin to measure my security by how good of a manifestor I am. 
how proficient I am at manifesting. How proficient I am at getting that which I desire to come to me as easily and effortlessly as possible. Because, by the way, when you make an intention, you can put those words at the end of it as easily as leave them off. You know, I intend that I am the owner of a new Toyota, and that it comes to me freely, easily, and effortlessly. So, that got me thinking about uh, security. And in the long run, our security is not truly tied to our money. Our security is it's something that comes from within us. Now, in many ways, like I said, he was sort of a harsh teacher. My second teacher, when we first started the Intenders Circle, um, there were four of us. And me and my girlfriend at the time, her name was Betsy, and our two friends, Mark and Tina. And one day, uh, Mark says that uh, Tina has a gift, that she's a messenger or a channel. And I said, oh, okay, what goes on there? And she says, well, I, I uh, say a prayer. Say a prayer I started with at the talk here today. And, uh, and I go into a mild trance, and out comes my higher self. And I call my higher self Li Ching. Li Ching, for those of you who are, uh, may not know about Li Ching, he is the archetype of mercy. He is the male counterpart to a better known archetype, the archetype of compassion, and her name is Quan Yin. So we had Quan Yin's boyfriend in our, <laughs> in our groups. And then after we'd have our tender circles, we'd have a 30 minute spiritual guidance session. And during that time, I asked uh, Li Ching, I said, I said, first of all, to Tina, I said, let's get Li Ching out of the box. I want to talk to him. <laughs> Over the next uh, couple of years, and we take all these sessions, uh, I asked him every question I could possibly think of. You know, what's going on with the economy? What's going on with the presidency? And what's going on with my gardens? And what's going on with my love life? And what's going on? Yep. Looking back, all of those, all of those uh, questions I asked, he answered uh, with such love and such caring and accurately that we never wanted those sessions together to end. So, and Li Ching, he was uh, so gentle and, and, and truly caring and loving. And his way of saying, BJ used to talk about the money and the security and being deliberately poor and, and all those things. And, uh, uh, and BJ put it a different way. BJ would say, I'm sorry, Li Ching put it a different way. He would say, uh, whenever I talk about money issues or whatever, He'd say, Tony, he said, you know, he said, uh, there may be times when you don't have any money, but you always have your intentions. And I, that just felt right to me. And just kept integrating that into my life. And again, so far, so good. So, so we, in the early days of Hedges, we just developed this thing called the intention process. And it's basically threefold. And the first step in it is to get up every morning and say your intentions, or your prayers, or your affirmations. They all work. Doesn't matter. For me, I get up in the morning and I say I'm good that I am happy, that I am healthy. And I'm enjoying my life to the fullest. And if I needed a material thing, I intend for the material thing. Since there's no limit on what you can think, no limit on what you can intend, no rules, nobody standing over us in our, inside our head with a whip saying, you have to think this and you have to say this. We can think and say what we want. So, and we found that those who get up in the morning and set the, their course in the day, 
by saying their prayers and their affirmations and their intentions, that their day goes entirely differently than someone who just gets up, has a cup of Starbucks, and hits the ground running. If the people who get up in the morning and say their intentions or prayers, things come to them easier. They get the things they want in life. Those who get up and just hit the ground running, well, whatever, whatever, anything goes. You never quite know what's going to happen. The second thing with this intention process, because we were interested in creating community as well, is to get together with a group of like-minded and light-hearted people and put intentions or prayers or whatever into a circle. We're going to do that tomorrow night at the Coptic Center. You're all invited. And, um, and we found that the more people you can get to align with your intentions, the quicker and easier they manifest it for you. That, uh, that there's strength in numbers. And eventually, that's what we all want to get in alignment. So, and I know there's folks who say, hmm, I don't know about telling somebody else it's my intentions. You know, worried about diluting my intentions or that person will try and sabotage me or if I tell them too much. And, and there's a point to that, but our third factor sort of takes care of it. We call it the world's greatest insurance policy. And it's, a, it's basically the highest good clause. And it goes like this. We say that after, after our intentions, we say our intentions, we would add this clause. It says, uh, in order for my intentions to manifest, that they must serve the highest and best good of the universe, ourselves, and everyone concerned. And we say, so be it, so it is. And what we found is that if the intention we make is in alignment with the highest good, it's going to manifest. Has to. Law of attraction works. And if it wasn't in alignment with the highest good, it wouldn't manifest. So the highest good sort of took care of a whole lot of stuff. So. Hmm. Highest good. It has bailed me out of more stuff in my life than I could possibly tell. Um, give an example of, of having put the intention process to work. I was going to an attender circle in Redding, California, just below Mount Shasta. Um, this was a, six years back. And as I was going up the hill there, my old green Dodge van started sputtering. <laughs> and so we pulled into a, a, a shop and it was staying there tonight. And, and we had, had to go to the intent circle, so the folks drove us over there. And when I was in the circle in Reading, I made the intention. I said, well, I intend that I have a new used uh, van that I really love. It's got all the bells and whistles. It runs perfect. and." Uh, and so forth, and, uh, and let it go. So, went back the next morning, got, the, got my Dodge van out of the shop, and while I was getting the Dodge van out of the shop, there was a lady walked in and put an ad on the, on the bulletin board there uh, for this beautiful uh, white, um, another Dodge van, like a, it was, it was a, a road trek is what it was. So, and, uh, and she had those little snippet things that you, you know, you take the scissors and you put the phone numbers along the thing. I, I took one of those things off the, the ad and stuck it in my pocket. And, uh, um, and I remember thinking to myself, well, oh, gosh, that, that, that's the band right there. Uh, she wanted $12,000 for it. And I had about a thousand at the time, and I thought, oh, I don't know how that could possibly happen, but I intended it anyway. Went to the next circle up I-5, those of you who know California, uh, I-5 runs the, the length, and uh, 
in Grants Pass, Oregon. We were in a yoga studio there that night. I had about 30 folks uh, in the circle. And when it came my time, to my attention in the circle, well, I did. I intended I have uh, a new used van that comes to me freely, easily, and effortlessly. And uh, has all the bells and whistles, and I love it. So generally, our circles last a couple hours. And, uh, I, was, I talked for uh, a while, and then we took a break. And during the break, I usually take a, take a walk and get some fresh air. And, and uh, I went out to take a, a walk, and a fellow followed me out of the circle, out to the street, where I was on the sidewalk, and he tapped me on the shoulder and introduced himself, said his name was Pete, and that uh, he just inherited more money than he knew what to do, and he'd buy me a van. <laughs> I went back and got the road trip. And I've had that happen so many times in so many different ways. I remember a time in Tucson where my little tenders handbooks, I, I printed them myself. I was out of handbooks. They're my bread and butter. You know, I don't know if uh, they're a bestseller by far, although maybe not on the New York Times lists. Um, and, um, and I needed $5,000 to reprint the handbook. I'd run out of them and I was on tour and didn't have any of my books. So uh, I'm in a circle in Tucson and said, I intend that I have $5,000 and it comes to me freely, easily, and effortlessly. And a fellow across the circle I'd never met, his name was Ron Carswell. Uh, he just blurted right out and he said, I'll give you $5,000 to me. And uh, I cannot tell you how good that feels. That when, when a manifestation like that happens in your life, and, and I'm a Course in Miracles person, whoop, I'm a Course in Miracles person, and the Course in Miracles is very clear right off the bat that there is no difficulty in the order of miracles. That you can manifest something small as easily as you can manifest something big. The only challenge with that is, <laughs> is that our, we were conditioned program to believe small. Yeah. Yeah. These are the days for turning all that around and thinking big, thinking unlimited, thinking no resistances, no limitations, because the only limitations that are there are the ones we put on ourselves. You can manifest anything if you believe that you can. And that's the key, the belief. You have to believe it. A lot of us think, uh, oh, I could manifest a thousand dollars, but I don't think I could manifest ten. And I think a, a lot of it, uh, a lot of it just has to do with what we're ready for, quite frankly. Well, that's interesting. I figured that if I want to know where I was going next, I keep some notes up here, and they're not there now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. First time I had to take a peek. <laughs> so, the highest good. My. Back in the 80s, I was very fortunate to go to Indonesia. Went to Bali three times. And one day, me and my friend Kathy, we were on little motorbikes. And we were up in a little up country town called Ubud. And then we headed even farther up into the hills, uh, under the jungle canopy. And we're on these little bikes, and it's hot. It's sweaty. It's just, uh, we're thirsty. There's nothing around. We were finally come upon a canteen. The canteen was just a little small clearing on the side of the road and had four po corner posts and a few pieces of uh, rusty roof tin. And in the middle of the canteen, there was one of these old red Coke boxes. 
and where you go up and you just lift the lid and take a coke out. Wow. Usually there was ice. There was no ice in there that day. But we didn't care. We we grabbed a coke each and paid for it, and uh, we sat down at the at a like a picnic table there under the, under that uh, canopy. That, and there were four guys back in the corner in the dark drinking tea, hot tea. That's what the Balinese do to cool off. They go in the dark shade and drink hot liquid. It works for them. So, uh, one of these men was uh, looking at us, and a beautiful smile on his face, and he, he came over and sat down uh, with us, and he told us a story, which I will tell you right now. He said that all of the villages in Bali, that they had each had an artistic specialty. Some are mask makers, beautiful painted masks that come out of Indonesia. Some are batik dyers and textile workers, working with the beautiful cloths that come there. Some are silversmiths, several different specialties. His particular village, they were fish carvers. And the way they would do the fish from as long as he could remember was that they would take a two-man bow saw, one guy on each end, and they would, they would fall the tree, very slow, laborious process. And then they would each get on the end of the, the fallen tree on each side and very slowly cut the slabs until they, at the end of the day, had a stack of slabs there. And then someone from the center of the village would come in and take the slabs out and they would carve them into the shapes of the beautiful tropical fish. And then someone would take those to another part of the village where they would paint them with the bright colors and then someone else in the village would take them to market into the town of Kuta or get them and ship to the docks. And uh, those are the little, the bright fish that you see in the gift shops around, around the world and such. So. And this they did, uh, again, for as long as he could remember. Then one day, one of his neighbors got a chainsaw. And right away, that neighbor was able to corner the market because <laughs> and all of a sudden he had so many slabs and so many fish that it upset the stability of the whole village of the market. And in order for the rest of the villagers to be able to even continue to support themselves in the manner to which they've been accustomed, they got chainsaws too. And what was once a quiet, peaceful, pristine jungle village turned into a noisy, oily, messy situation. And it went on like this for a while. And one day the elders in the community got together and they had a meeting. And the elders decided that it would be best for the whole village if they put the chainsaws away and went back to the old ways. Interestingly, not one person in the village squawked. Nobody complained. And everybody put the chainsaws away and went back to doing it the old way. And right away, life in the village returned to the peace, the quiet, the pristine cleanliness that was there before they brought the technology in. All because the villagers knew something 
that we in our culture are yet to learn. We're just now starting to get it. That it's always best for the community, for the whole of the community, when the highest good of the whole community is honored. So, we're getting it though. The highest good. It's what's going to bring us the peace that John was talking about this morning. It's what's going to bring us all what we're looking for in our lives. Just aligning with that highest good. <laughs> Everything works best when the highest good of the whole community is on. Now, I'm going to shift gears here. I want to tell you a story that really has nothing to do with manifesting the law of attraction, that kind of stuff. But it's the story of my second teacher, Lee Ching. And it's something that, that in, our, in our world today, more and more people need to be thinking about. Lee Ching uh, has had many lifetimes up on this planet. He's not on the planet right now uh, in physical form. But uh, there was a time back before the times of Atlantis, <coughs> in a land that was called Lemuria, that existed out in the Pacific Ocean, that has since sunk under the waves, just as Atlantis did. And in this uh, particular time period, it was toward the end of the two cultures, and they were warring Atlantis and Lemuria. There was an overlap. And they were at war uh, and dealing with wars in much the same way as we are today. Li Qing himself was the commander in chief of the Lemurian armies. And this particular day there was a battle raging and in a valley, and there were 10,000 soldiers in the in, a, in the valley, and the valley floor was strewn with the blood and bodies of fallen soldiers. And they were all fighting uh, all day long, sword to sword combat, this to this combat. And Li Qing, toward the end of the day, as the sun was getting ready to go down, found himself in sword to sword combat with a younger, stronger foe, a young man who, and the two of them fought for 20, 30 minutes in the center of the battlefield with the others fighting around them to the limits of their endurance. And Li Qing finally hit the fellow with the, the sword, broadside actually, and the fellow stepped back and he fell over the body of a fallen soldier. And the young soldier, the, the young warrior who he was fighting, is laying on his back. And his helmet flew off. And Li Cheng looked at him just as before he was getting to, ready to run him through. And he realized, this is just a boy. He's, he's not even, hasn't even tasted the fruits of life yet. And it stopped him. And he took another minute and he, he looked in the young man's eyes. And in that instant, he saw a part of himself. And he knew that if he were to run the young man through, he would only be harming himself. So he threw his sword aside and walked over to a little hillside and bowed his head in prayer, asking God for forgiveness for all he had done in his life as a warrior. 10,000 people saw as he bowed his head and a light began to glow. 
The more he prayed, the more the light became brighter. And even after a few moments, he began to lift off the earth and ascend. And he ascended to a, uh, just above head height and floated over to a place in the center of the battlefield next to the young man he'd been fighting with earlier. And he helped him up. And he embraced him. And he bid him to go back to his family and fiance and to live out the rest of his years in peace. Whereupon, all 10,000 soldiers that day dropped their swords, went back to their respective friends and families to tell the story of the great warrior general who dispensed that which is termed mercy. He let the other man go free. And whereupon the word spread from there all across the land. And peace reigned again for a thousand years following that. All because he applied mercy. Mercy. It's the one ingredient that nobody talks about much nowadays. It's the one ingredient that's missing in our world. And yet, who amongst us, when faced with the point of the sword, would deny themselves mercy? Who amongst us would not ask for mercy himself? I suggest to you that the message that Lee Ching gave us that day that it is time to be reawakened and brought back into the forefront. <laughs> <laughs> the forefront of our culture. Mercy. Oh my. How are we doing? Doing great. All right. This is the this is the fun stuff coming up. Stephen asked me to lead a meditation at the end, and, and I'm more of a toner, so we'll be toning with toner. Can you hear me okay? Okay. So I've, uh, I've gone around this country for many, many years and been in a whole lot of churches and so forth, across the land, and noticed that oftentimes when I would leave the church, I felt like uh, I, I missed something, and, and I felt like uh, what, what happened was that they didn't set the stage for a true spiritual experience to occur. Uh, they didn't set the stage for oneness, for unity to occur. And oneness is the spiritual experience. It's where we're all headed, because we're all one anyway. We just sort of got separated. So what I like to do is to set the stage for oneness to occur. And it seems like that's the thing to do. Anytime, anytime I'm in a group of spiritually minded people, it seems like we would be remiss if we did not set the stage for unity, for the actual feeling, the actual experience of oneness. So the way I like to do it, we've done this I don't know, a thousand times in different groups around, around the country, is uh, there's a little formula. And the first part of the formula, which we'll do in a moment, is touching. In a moment, we'll all uh, make a big circle around the chairs here and hold hands in a circle and touch. That creates a connection. No different than plugging in a toaster. The toaster won't work if you don't plug it in. <clears throat> so it's just so much easier to create the oneness if you plug it in, if you hold hands. 
The second thing is a blending. A blending. And the idea in creating oneness is to all get on the same page, so to speak. And by that I mean nobody's really a lot louder than anybody else. And we, we do our best to create that which is often called harmonic choir. And I know all, not all of us perhaps have, a, have the uh, um, beautiful singing voices and so forth, but we're just going to tone, ah, like that, or ah, I'll, I'll start it. And I remember back in uh, my hometown of Pagosa Springs, we were in our contender circle and we were uh, standing at the end of the circle holding hands and, and Tony, and one of the fellows in our circle was a uh, fairly well-known opera singer. So we're all telling ah, and he's going ah. <laughs> you can't get to oneness if that happens. <laughs> <laughs> if somebody's ego takes over and wants to run the show, it's, it's, <laughs> I was in another circle, and, and the third, uh, the, the third factor that is all important in creating the oneness. Am I on? Yeah. yeah okay. Uh, is holding the silence after we tell them. Because it's in the silence following the tone that the oneness really gels. It's in the silence following the toning where the angels work their magic. That's where the feeling goes. So if you, uh, we had, I, again, I had this lady in Houston one time, and we were uh, toning, oh, I guess about uh, oh, 30 of us or so in a circle in her backyard. It was a summer night. And we, we got in the pocket, just like a, a band. You get in the pocket when, when you're telling them sometimes. And we were right there. It was so beautiful. And just as we finished it, and uh, 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 the, the feeling was just palpable, the leader of their group dropped her hands, let go of the touching, and went, wow, that feels good. <laughs> if you get a hankering to do that, Please don't. <laughs> Just let the silence take over. We have a standard rule of thumb. Today, for instance, we'll tone for two or three minutes. One minute isn't quite enough. But two or three minutes. Just going, ah. Uh, and then we hold the silence for an equal length of time. So for as long as we tone, two or three minutes, We'll hold the silence for two, three, four minutes afterwards. You'll see. You'll just be. You'll just be like this, and you'll, you'll uh, be feeling really good. And you'll be looking up inside your head. There'll be a light go on, and everything else just seems to go away. So, I had a fellow. I take part in a drumming circle back in Pagosa Springs on Southern Colorado, and. Uh, there was a fellow in the drumming circle. We were drumming with him in there too. And we were right there and we finished the drumming and we were all just sort of right, right in. And, uh, and he was a big man sitting on my left, big guy. Arms were huge. And, and, I, uh, and just as we finished, he started tapping the drum again. And I grabbed his arm and <laughs> pull it back. And got him back and, and uh, kept him from uh, sort of spoiling the, the uh, experience. So, again, holding the silence after we do the telling. That's where the real good stuff happens. So, let's all get up, if you don't mind, and we'll just make a big circle.
Closing and final closing. If you would join me in the singing and the singing of this sacred hymn. Zippity doo da, zippity doo da.